Chapter 50 Kester Soul Weekender. <laughs> This one's for the Fusion Affair and also the Pennington Soul Partners. All right, all right, all right. That's one of the big ones down here in the 10th case, sir. Oh, my good God. Third night, we're all looking kind of, well, kind of good. No one's looking too knackered out there. Right, Freddie's now ready. We've got both machines working. We're going to go up nice and high. A lot of people wanted the Jeffrey Daniels thing from yesterday. Now we've got them working properly. We'll have a bash. <laughs> For the vast majority of you, the words Caster Soul Weekender will mean nothing to you. Bodidly squat. But for a few thousand people here in the UK, those words will represent blissful happiness and good times. Although the lads and myself first visit to Caster wasn't until 1998, our story with the Caster Soul Weekender started all the way back in 1980. We were all just out of high school, bushy-tailed and bright-eyed. When a friend of ours just got back from the Case to Soul Weekender the season before, because it was held twice a year. And the stories that he told us about the events that took place at the Weekender, we thought was just simply unbelievable. Now, one of the things he said that caught our attention is when he said, whatever you do, do not bring your girlfriend with you. That wasn't a problem for us at the time. I mean, apart from Danny, we didn't have a girlfriend anyway. However, the feedback he gave, he almost made it sound like a Roman orgy. And this is precisely why we thought, nah, sounds too good to be true. But then when we started hitting the clubs and the parties and meeting friends on the streets, we kept on hearing the same words coming out of people's mouths. Caster, soul weekender. On the streets in our neighbourhood, word was rapidly getting round about this caster. It was a combination of people who had been or people who were booked up to go to the next one. And worst of all, people who were independent from our friend who went to Caster so Weekender was confirming some of the stories that he told us. Now, you have to bear in mind, this is 1980. We had just left school. We were just approaching our sexual prime. So if you likened experience of sexual adventures to a party, we would have just been arriving at the front door. And as teenagers in our mid-teens, oh boy, was we eager to get inside that party. Oh my God. In the old school street talk, we were well craven. As they say in the new school, we were thirsty. So by the time we came across the eighth or ninth person who was talking about this case to Soul Weekend, that was it. It was done deal. Now we wanted to go. We, we wanted in. But we made a fundamental error. Error number one, we wasn't proactive in organising the next visit ourselves. That was the big, big error we made. Second error, we waited a tad too long before we spoke about organising a trip. And the biggest error of all, we depended on a third party to organise our booking, thus losing our deposit money. Because I believe the promotion company wasn't directly attached to Case of Soul Weekender. I think they were like a subcontractor and they ceased trading. So <laughs> our deposit money went with them and we were absolutely devastated. We are oh, it was it was like as though your country got to the world you know, football world cup finals and they lost on penalties i remember being at the all nighter at the lyceum in london's west end with danny's younger brother and the late dj steve walsh rest in peace made an announcement saying if anybody's willing to come up on stage and do a mooney he will get a free ticket to the case to Soul Weekender. And I remember me and Paul, we just looked at each other as I say, are you going to do it? Are you going to do it? <laughs> we, we were too chicken shit to do it. And the offer made for the women, if a woman was to prepare to come on stage and take her top off, exposing her, her boobs, 
she would get a free ticket to the Case of Soul Weekender. And within five minutes, that was achieved. So fast forward 18 years later to 1998, on the back of a documentary about the Case of Soul Weekender that kindled our sort of curiosity. And we said, yeah, come on, let's organise it. We always wanted to go to the Case of Soul Weekender, so let's do it. But this time round, we did things properly and we was all booked up and we were on our way. But in 1998, there was a significant difference between us guys to the teenage version of us back in 1980. Back in 1980, our priority list was getting laid first and having a boogie second. But by 1998, our priority list was having a good boogie first and enjoying ourselves and getting laid was way, 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 way down the list. In other words, we didn't give a flying fuck whether we got a fuck. And for the benefit of any young men starting out on the dating scene listening to this, I shall point out the irony with a difference later. However, there was one thing that still remained the same to 1980, apart from Danny. Again, we didn't have a girlfriend, and this included Danny this time. Danny's 11-year relationship ended in 1994, and between 1994 and 1998, he had semi-long-term relationships uh, between then, which would have been Elizabeth from Derby um, that ended around the year before. And Benjamin, he was out of an eight-year relationship. I can't remember exactly when his ended, but his ended roughly around the same as Danny's back in 94 or 93, somewhere around that time. But he, he had been sort of in and out of you know, casual relationships since then. And you already know the score with me in terms of long term relationships. I was just damned unlucky. So after a two and a half to three hours drive from West London to Great Yarmouth, we eventually arrived at the Vauxhall Holiday Park, Case the Soul Weekender. We went through the rigmarole of the registration of our bookings. We received our chalet key. We had to find our chalets. We put our stuff down, had a little freshen up. Took a little exploration of the place to see what was where. And then eventually we hit the dance floor. Now, here in the UK, black men are known for arriving late. So we kept the tradition. But we arrived at the case the party 18 years late. Now, the first thing we all picked up on was the case the code. And this case the code says everybody is welcomed regardless of who you are or what you are. And what would happen with this case to code? Almost everybody, when you walk past them, whether they be male or female, they'd give you eye contact and you'd either receive a, a friendly nod or they'll actually say hello, good night or whatever, or smile or something like that. And this case to code comes with no strings attached. It was a simple, you know, we're here to party. We, we are of the same mindset and hello, fellow party people. And that was the code. The artist that sums this code up the best is George Clinton from the band called Funkadelic and Parliament. And these are the words from one of his most famous records. One nation under a groove. And now the thing is with this case to code, in a way you could identify the people who had never been to Caster before, because some people simply, they just didn't have the code in their vibes. You could, you could tell this, this was something quite alien to them. I remember in particular, this very attractive light skinned black woman. She definitely didn't understand the case to code at the beginning of the weekend. Now, this is not a criticism. This is purely an observation I made. The impression I got from her is that she brought the outside world with her into Caster. I would hazard a guess that she's used to a lot of male attention being so attractive. So she read when she received a nod from a guy or hello from a guy, she read that as hello. I would like to stick my penis in your vagina. Now, I'm sure out of the thousands of people 
that attended that case to that weekend. I'm sure there must have been some men who had that intention. But really, the case to code, as I said, it comes with no strings attached. Now, whether that code existed back in 1979 when it started and throughout the early 80s, I don't know because we wasn't there. But you've got to remember, most of the people, 90% of the people who were at Caster had been going since 1979 when it started. And like us, now they were a lot older. And a person who was in their mid-teens to someone who's in their mid-30s is a very different person in most cases. So the lady in question had that cold, defensive vibe as a result of getting probably a lot of unwanted attention from men. So in the words of the old school street talk, she appeared quite stush, another word for stuck up. But the joke was, it wasn't until the actual end of the weekend at the finale, that's when she finally got it. You could see in her body language, she finally got the code because she seemed a lot more freer, a lot more smiley. She seemed a lot more relaxed. She was dancing. She was actually, you know, people would say hello and she would say hello back. And she actually, I think she realized by then, hold on a minute, it's quite safe to be friendly. It's quite safe. You know, you're not going to get jumped on. You're not going to get harassed. And even if a guy did make a pass at at Kester, nine times out of ten, if he was politely declined, it would be no problem. He would just simply just walk away. And he would still be merry about it. So it's not like probably the, the hostile outside world that she's used to. Now, Kester is divided into two rooms. He had a big room and a small room. Now, the smaller room played the music that was aimed more towards the connoisseur, the more funky underground bouncy beats. Whereas in the big room, though they'll drop the odd funky beats here and there, most of the music had a more of a mainstream sounding style, but without actually being mainstream, because outside of Caster, the average person probably wouldn't know most of the records played in the big room, but it still had a more of a mainstream sounding style compared to the smaller room. So, of course, us guys being funky boogie boys, we was in the thick of the small room. We were like pig in muck. We was getting down hard in the small room to the dirty underground beats. Then, of course, when we wanted a bit of a relax of pace, we would then party in the big room. Case that also had the swim pool and that's where they'd have the pool parties. That was quite fun as well. And Saturday night, for those who wanted to participate, was fancy dress. Now, the promise I made to the young men listening earlier on when I was talking about the irony with not giving a fuck, if you got a fuck. Something me and the lads learned over the years on our journey on the dating scene is when you're eager to get your end away, when you're eager to get laid, when you really give a fuck about getting a fuck, it shows in your body language. Remember, body language is unspoken words. And the crazy thing is that vibe you'd be giving off would more than likely work against you because for a lot of women, it'll be a turn off that you seem so eager because that eagerness can be easily construed as desperate. And desperate is a very unattractive trait especially to women whereas when you don't care your focus is not on getting laid your focus is on having a good time and you're happy you're partying because you're in the moment and you're having a whale of a time that is very attractive very very attractive because you're not threatening and it, it gives off a warm aura and the word attractive it attracts it attracts people towards you, especially women. It attracts the energy towards you. And you're more likely going to be successful <laughs> when you don't give a shit. <laughs> and this is precisely what happened to me during the day on the Saturday. I met a mature curvy blonde at the pool party. And we got on so well that, <laughs> well, one thing led to another when she said that, oh, she's got a chalet all to herself. And I picked up on the hint 
And she told me to meet her after she got out of the pool at the chalet. So, of course, I ran back to the chalet out where I was, bust into the room like I was a policeman on a drugs raid. At the time, Danny and Benji, they was in the chalet because they're not really one for going swimming. And the way I rushed in and I was going through the drawers, he goes, you got lucky. I said, yeah, yeah, I need to get some condoms. And I ran out again. And then the crazy thing, the Saturday night, I met a biracial or mixed race lady that I met up with a few times after Kester. But that encounter didn't lead to a long term relationship anyway, because though I liked her, I wasn't like crazy about her. But the more I met her, the more she was put me off because I saw a side of her that I really didn't like. And that side was, she was very critical towards people. She had a very negative energy. She very, uh, she, she always looked for something to criticize somebody on. And I just didn't like that. And I didn't really want to be around somebody who gave off those sort of negative vibes. But anyway, we all had an excellent time at the Case to Soul weekend. We met so many people, male and female. Danny, he, he met a beautiful Nubian woman. If you're those who are not familiar with the word Nubian, dark skin, she was a fine dark skin sister. And not only was she fine as in her looks, she was absolutely beautiful in her personality. She was such a lovely woman. She really was. And Danny was so content to be with her. It was like as though they were, I don't know, a couple for years. Uh, sadly, it didn't really amount to anything. As for Benji, I mean, he didn't get laid, but I mean, he still stole a kiss anyway. But like I said, the basic vibe between all of us, we didn't really give a shit whether we got laid or not. That really was not our focus. And this is the message I want to give out to the young men is when you give a shit, that's when nothing really comes your way is when I emphasize when you're just out to party and have a good time first. That's when you're more than likely. <laughs> it kind of works the opposite. When you want, you don't get. And when you don't give a shit about the want, that's when you tend to get. So, 18 years later, we made our first visit to the Case to Soul Weekender. And this was not going to be our last. And Kester definitely had a lot more in store for my journey on the dating scene. Now, I should leave you with the Case to Code. Until the next chapter. One nation under a roof. Getting down just for the problem. One nation.